Karen Pack, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and Community Matters. And we have Andrew Morgan with us today. He's the executive director of the Hawaii Opera Theater. It's very important that we check around the community, see how people are doing in the, in the world of the coronavirus. And sometimes it's uh, really surprising. We didn't, we didn't see and understand how our institutions are doing until now. Now, when we look at it under duress this way, we find out so much more we never knew before. Hi, Andrew. It's so nice to have you on the show. Really, really great to have the opera represented here. Find out what's going on with you. Thanks so much, Jay. I'm really pleased to be here. So you're executive director. You're, you're at the yeah. eye of the storm, so to speak. <laughs> and here this comes sweeping down on you in March, February, when, you know, you, uh, I guess you got through uh, uh, the Figaro production, all right. But uh, yeah. then you, you have, have another one coming up and you canceled that. Can you talk about it? Sure. Yeah, actually uh, coming up on my one year anniversary. So I've gotten through a couple of productions since I started. But um, yeah, the, uh, you know, we started hearing rumblings about the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, knew something was going to have to happen. And we were we were about to make that decision on our own. Um, when we uh, learned the news of the Blaisdell uh, concert hall closing, or the, actually the whole uh, complex closing. And so that kind of took the decision out of our hands, but it was the one we had to make anyways for the best of, the, for the good of our company, for the good of our patrons um, and the artists that would be coming to uh, Hawaii. Um, so we were fortunate that our production was far enough off that we were able to alert the artists um, before they were coming. Uh, of course, airfares had been purchased and plans were made and contracts and everything. So it's a, it's a, it was a difficult decision, a difficult situation for everyone involved. And, uh, you know, we'll be yeah. feeling the impacts of it for years, the art, the, oh, the whole sure. arts community. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, it, it's fragile anyway to be in the performing arts when you have a following and, and, you, you know, you're sort of thin skinned on the financial side and all of a sudden surprises are really no good for you. Um, and I'm just, uh, you know, wondering, uh, I, I guess it's a good thing that Blaisdell canceled because otherwise you would have been in a kind of dilemma angst kind of thing. Should we or shouldn't, shouldn't we cancel? And, and then that, that kind of decision gets delayed and, and then, you know, the, the damage gets worse if you delay, we know that. So actually, yeah, uh, and, serendipitous. Although I will, yeah, I will say that the, the day that the Blaisdell announced was the same day that the board had voted to, to cancel oh, the production. Perfect. Was, we, we, would have, we would have made the announcement uh, on that day anyways. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, uh, it, it provided us some backup with the decision that it was the right yeah. thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if people realize that you, you go around the world uh, auditioning people and finding stars, mm -hmm. or making contracts with them, arranging for them to come yeah. out here, arranging, uh, yep. for example, hotels, or sometimes people uh, offer them uh, rooms in their homes, which is very nice. I know a few people who do that. Um, <clears throat> and on setting it all up. And one thing about opera is it's multi multi arts, and which means you have so much detail to attend to. Uh, you know, you have you have the singing, you have the stars, um, you have the orchestra, you have the dancers, and you have the costumes, you have the wigs, and it goes on and on. How many things you got to attend to? And when somebody pulls the plug, ha! Huh, it's it must be very it must be nerve wracking, no? <laughs> there, there are definitely a lot of balls in the air with any opera production, um, and yeah, you're right. It takes months and months of planning, if not years. Um, and you know, you hate to. No one wants to see something canceled that you've worked so hard on to get ready to go. And obviously, the singers have been working on their parts for months and months. The, the um, you know, the conductor, the stage director, all those people have put in a lot of time and effort into making sure that this production of Salome would have been fantastic. Um, in some ways, we are we were fortunate in the decision that I'd made last spring uh, to convert the production to a semi-staged version rather than a full-on production with sets and costumes. Uh, that was done for budgetary uh, reasons, but uh, it was the right thing to do and I think still would have prevent, presented the... I was still very excited about the production happening. We were doing some innovative things, planning some innovative things within the context of a semi-staged version. Um, well, what is semi-staged, Andrew? 
What is so that? semi-stage? Uh, semi-stage people would be singing off book. They would be walking the parts like they were act, you know, the acting the roles. Um, the orchestra would be on stage. Uh, we were planning on a platform that went behind behind the orchestra, then kind of forward on the stage, so there was some playing space for the for the singers. But they were they would not be wearing costumes. They would not be there would not be a set for them to work off of. We would probably have a chair and a table or a throne for Herod, that sort of thing. Um, but but minimalist uh, production, um, and so that meant that we had no costumes in route. We had no no sets being shipped to us or being built here. Um, no wigs to deal with. Um, but still, it's it it you know it still hurts to have to cancel something anything. Oh sure. Well, you save money uh, by doing a semi staged, uh, but yes. uh, at the same time, um, you know, you'd rather you'd rather do it the way you set it up. So I guess um, you know uh, the the question is, uh, can you? We we can't go. We're not going to have the chance to see Salome. We're not going to. We can't see it. So that's why I wanted that's to right. ask you: Can you tell us about the opera? What happens? What distinguishes this opera? Give us a precy in like three minutes, okay? Oh, okay. Well, um, so it it is based on the biblical story, but more closely based on the play by um, Oscar Wilde about Salome. And uh, she is a, a, a beautiful woman. She is the stepdaughter of Herod, the king, um, who has married her mother Herodias. Uh, and John the Baptist is in this, and, and he has been crying uh, uh, out against Herod and Herodias as an incestuous relationship. Uh, because it is his brother's wife that he's married, um, and so it's it's quite it's quite a scandalous tale even now um, with the the idea that that uh, Salome lusts after John the Baptist and decides she must have him. He of course declines because of his uh, faith and uh, his dedication to the coming Messiah, and so she uh, takes upon herself the um, the Herod asks her to dance the dance of the seven veils. And she agrees to do that on the con uh, with the caveat that he will grant her anything she desires. And so at the end of the dance, she says what she wants is the head of John the Baptist on a silver plate. She, he brings it to her, or a guard brings it to her, and then she kisses the mouth of John the Baptist, the, the head, the severed head. And um, Herod decides, okay, she's so crazy, um, and orders her put to death, and that's the end of the opera. <laughs> Does that make it a tragedy? A happy story. <laughs> Happy story. <laughs> yeah. So, what now? What about your stars? Did you have world class stars here uh, who would have we come did. and thrilled um, us? Yeah, um, our Salome was Elizabeth Blanca Biggs, who has sung the role before. She did it at Mexico City, um, and our Herod. Oh, I'm going to blank on the names now. I'm sorry, you put me on the spot. I didn't know you were one. Sure. <laughs> the Just cast. a couple of them. Uh, couple but anyways, of them. yes, we we had lined up a really fantastic uh, cast. Our our Herodias was a uh, old friend of mine that uh, was an Adler Fellow at San Francisco Opera. It was uh, Davida Caranes, um, and it it was just going to be fantastic. And of course, um, Emmanuel Plasson was to conduct, um, and we had uh, stage director Shauna Lucy, who's worked at uh, Santa Fe Opera, San Francisco Opera, The Met. Um, just a really dynamite uh, uh, team that was going to put this together for us. Regrettably, going to lose a lot of money uh, for you know the the fact that it uh, it can't be performed. Uh, and I know you went yeah. out to uh, your your um, your viewers, your audio followers, uh, people like me, uh, and you uh, you suggested the possibility that we not ask for a refund. Um, yes. and, and leave that for support of the opera. What kind of response have you had to that suggestion? So far, overwhelmingly positive. We've gotten, um, we've, we've got about half the people responding back to us and overwhelmingly they're, they're donating their tickets back. And um, because I, I feel it's important for, for our industry and for our company and the aloha spirit that this company brings uh, to Opera World, um, we're establishing an artist support fund through those donated tickets. And so once we have a better sense of what that total fund will be, we'll be able to uh, parse out some percentage of compensation for all the artists who had their cancel contracts canceled because of the, the production being uh, eliminated. Um, so I'm nice. really, I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful we'll be able to uh, provide some meaningful compensation to those artists. Um, even, even with the, um, the bill that was passed, the two trillion dollar bill that was passed by Congress that extended unemployment benefits to contractors like 
uh, professional opera singers are. You know, they're gig workers. They go from opera company to opera company. Um, I'm hearing from my colleagues uh, that are uh, full-time singers that the states, it's, it's, it's varying the responses from state to state on whether they're actually being accepted or denied in those unemployment claims. So there's a lot of people really hurting uh, at this time uh, because thousands and thousands of contracts were canceled. I mean, the Met alone uh, had thousands oh, of contracts sure. canceled by, by canceling their entire season through the end of the, the, sum, the, the oh. through June, right, through May. Um, you know, and that's and their orchestra and chorus all laid off. I mean, it's it's really bad time to be to be a classical musician. Well, any musician really, because pop gigs are canceled too. Oh boy, and the performing arts in general we're really in the same situation between um, you know the orchestra, the ballet, uh, chamber music, yeah. what have you. It, yeah, there's plenty of pain to go around from this pandemic. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, I think I think there are. Uh, there are a lot of there's a lot of goodwill out there, and I think there, that we will we will come back, uh, you know, uh, roaring. But uh, you know, it's going to be a changed landscape. Um, I'm already hearing rumblings of, of artists that are are concerned about uh, what's called a force majeure uh, clause in most contracts about canceling for war or famine or <laughs> or pandemic. Um, and I and I get the sentiment, you know, I understand, um, but it's not. It's not like companies like us want to cancel things. You know, we want to be presenting. Well, we we're an opera company. We present operas. So if we can't present operas, we're not making the income that then provides income to those artists. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the problem is that uh, this is an event. An opera is an event, and it means people are close mm -hmm. uh, to each other and uh, they're breathing on each other. But you don't have to <laughs> cough or sneeze. You just breathe on the guy next door. What are you going to do? Well, have every third seat filled? Are you going to are you going to tell the players to stand at great distance? Not going to work. The orchestra, they, yeah. they can't sit close to it. You know, not going to work. No, I mean the orchestra was barely going to fit on the stage anyways. Salome is a big orchestra. I mean, we were doing right. a reduced version as it was, and it's still sixty-seven players on stage. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, yeah. So do you think there's a you know you talk about the changes. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, you know, the opera and other performing arts as well um, will come out differently in terms of the way they present? You know, the thing about the opera is it, it's very, it's pure, you know, no microphones. Yeah. You got to belt it yeah. out there. You got to make everybody in the house hear you. And, um, and to use electronic means such as we're using now is really yeah. not, that's not opera. On the other hand, it does suggest that, that maybe music will come together electronically. I, I know that's offensive in some way, but what do you think? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it, it's been, it, it's gone back and forth over the last decade or so about what, you know, actually longer than that, uh, uh, Benjamin Britten wrote an opera for television. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's not a new concept particularly, but I think this is, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So I think we're seeing a lot of experimentation happening um, through Zoom or other uh, type of uh, conferencing uh, mediums. And uh, I do think you'll see more experimentation with that, even once we're able to, thankfully, hopefully, uh, rejoin our, our audiences live in, in our performing venues. Uh, but I, I think you won't see this stop now. I think you'll you will see. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see chamber operas written for um, Zoom or Skype. Uh, I, I think that's just kind of going to be happening. And you do have to have microphones for such a thing. You won't be able you to do. belt it out. You, you do, although it's not technically it's not for amplifying though it's just for generating the sound period okay so it, it'll be kind of like watching a, a well the met broadcast at the at the, you know movie theaters it's the same yeah. sort of thing they're they are singing without mics in the theaters but they are getting picked up on mics so that you can you can hear them in hawaii yeah. i i really like the met broadcast and i always say to myself gee hawaii opera theater you know get a few videographers i can connect you up with some guys um, you yeah. know, and do something that looks like that, uh, and then and put it on, you know, cable or television, and uh, people would watch that with the same relish, really, that they would watch uh, the Metropolitan. And so maybe you can yeah. have a season that, that expands into this kind of problem. 
It could be. It's all a matter of resources. Um, you know, cameras are expensive. Camera operators that do well are expensive. And obviously you'd have to compensate and should compensate the musicians and the singers differently um, for that sort mm -hmm. of uh, capture. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't see why not. Um, I will say, though, that the Met kind of has a, a lock on that. Um, there's, a, there's an aspect <laughs> of their they're kind of uh, hogging out the territory and I, I don't blame them. They, you know, but uh, San Francisco Opera attempted, while I was working at San Francisco Opera, they were attempting to do a cinema series as well and just could not get the traction because they couldn't be in theaters that they needed oh, to be in. Interesting. So, uh, there's you know, what, one of the things that, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the, is the orchestra. Because the orchestra, as you said, it was like 69 and, and 70 is a benchmark. When you're around 70, you're, you're really <laughs> filling the pit. So you are, yes. They, they had to walk away from this and their union, they had to walk away from this and they didn't earn any money. I mean, did you have a, a contract issue with them? Uh, did they have a, a, you know, a gig problem? I don't know how it works with the orchestra. Uh, they they well, must have been hurt by this. Yeah, I, I'm sure they are. You, I mean, you should talk to them directly about that uh, particular aspect of it. But but yes, I mean, we are all uh, being impacted significantly, negatively, financially uh, by this. Um, they had, they, uh, we contract through uh, Hawaii Symphony Orchestra for our uh, concerts. I, I reinstated that when I got here. So this entire season has been through um, them that organization and uh, we were working on we we've actually been working on a multi-year contract with agreement with them but uh, have been doing show to show this season and so i had mm -hmm. a, a single you know a contract specifically for salome um it also had a force majeure clause so technically you know we don't owe them anything and certainly the the collective bargaining agreement they had with the musicians also had that force majeure Clause. But but again, uh, I know the symphony is working on uh, continuing paying their musicians, and we are dedicated to including them uh, in the artist support fund. So uh, it'll be some percentage again of what the total fee would have been. But um, I I think they deserve it. You know, they worked hard, uh, and we we love we love our players. I mean, they're, they're amazing orchestra. Um, we want to have a good relationship with them. We want them to know that they're valued. Um, and so I, I believe strongly in that. So we will, we will do what we can. Um, you know, I can't, I can't damage the long-term health of the, the company and I don't think anyone would want me to do that, but what we can do, we will do. Good. You know, the, 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 the players are an important part of the production for sure. They, uh, they are definitely. So you have a, a very rich and robust program of opera education. You must have mm -hmm. half a dozen separate educational programs going on with the schools, with, with kids all over the islands. Um, you have people yeah. who, within the company, who spend all their time educating the community and especially the kids in the schools uh, about this. But uh, th you must have been seriously wounded because you can't do that anymore. Uh, tell me how it yeah. happened. Tell me, tell me what you were doing and, and how they, these programs were uh, impacting. Well, it's it's really tragic that we weren't able to com successfully complete all our programs for the spring semester. Um, so yes, we do have multiple um, education programs. We have the uh, Opera Express, which is a touring show of a 45-minute version of an opera. This year it was Rossini's uh, La Cenerentola or Cinderella, um, which we had done successfully all fall and we're, we're continuing through the spring. It was supposed to uh, tour to the Big Island in May, so all of and finalize, uh, f finish up touring in on Oahu. But uh, obviously all of that had to, to be canceled because of the uh, pandemic and school closures. Uh, and um, we also have uh, Opera for Everyone, which is the uh, final dress rehearsal for each production where we invite uh, students and their families and teachers to come see uh, a live uh, dress rehearsal for the production. Obviously the Salome canceled that, had to get canceled. Uh, for this spring, we have um, our young opera, uh, young artist program, the Orvis Studio and the Orvis High School uh, Studio. Those uh, both had uh, master classes. That there was a, a wonderful uh, coach and conductor, Mark Morash, who was coming into town, who actually came into town to do a week of residency with our young artists and 
he had to leave in the middle of that uh, to get back to San Francisco uh, and get an, into his own shelter from home with his family. So that didn't com come to completion. We had several recitals in the spring that were supposed to happen with these young artists. Those aren't taking place. Um, the, the biggest heartache for me would, was the residency programs, um, which we do in schools, uh, mostly elementary school, where we have a teaching artist that goes into the school and composes an opera based on a topic that the students select. They, they write the lyrics together, then uh, one of our staff uh, sets it to music, so like a, from Carmen or Boheme or, or uh, Aida, and then they come together and actually produce a, a performance of it with sets and costumes that the kids make themselves, and it's then performed for the school and uh, their families. And there was several of those queuing up for their final performances in April and May, and it, that's the real crushing blow of all the work these these kids put in, uh, into those performances with their teachers, and those those performances just won't happen. We certainly have offered to the schools the ability to extend it to the fall so they can see the completion of the, the production, but um, the schools were hesitant, hesitant to commit because um, I mean, there's so much pressure really? on teachers' time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe they can, uh, you know, listen on their, their favorite um, music app on their phones and uh, get familiar with uh, opera that way. I'll tell you one thing. I mean, it's just personal, but uh, you know, here we are in in locked in lockdown fashion, and we have to find constructive ways to spend our time. I mean, for me, mm -hmm. I can I can talk to guys like you. I'm very lucky, um, but I also have to, you know, I have to find ways to fill my time with you know, productive things and, and pleasurable things. And one of the things I do is I listen to opera. I'm not kidding. I walk around the neighborhood with my phone and I, I click into Amazon Music and I go one one opera after another. I haven't listened to so much opera ever before. So <laughs> That's I, great. It's I good for your soul. <laughs> so, but in terms of the season that you've had, uh let me see if i can remember uh, tosca was the first one back back october yep. was it um yep. how did that go uh what what sort of response did you get from the community that's one of my favorites actually um it is and, one uh, of my favorites know. too it's it's kind of the perfect opera right it's got everything except surprisingly everyone dies at the end not just the soprano or the tenor but, uh, the soprano tenor and the and the, and the villain dies so you, some sort of sense of closure i suppose you know there can't be a sequel because everyone's dead um, it, it was very well received um you know ticket sales were uh good not great uh, but that's, you know, kind of the way of most performing arts organizations. It's we're struggling to get audiences, um, but uh, it, it did well, uh, certainly critically acclaimed. And the people that saw it thought it was, and I would agree with this, that it's as good as any other company could possibly do with the, with the opera. Um, then in February, we did uh, Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, which was a kind of a Valentine's Day offering. And, and that one, so really, so really Valentine's Day, uh, I think, helped that uh, propel that over our goal on, on uh, ticket sales, um, had really great enthusiastic crowds and, and just a fantastic cast, uh, really perfect production uh, for me of a, another one of my, what I call desert island operas. You know, if you're standing <laughs> on a desert island, what would you want to have with you? It's, it's Tosca and Marriage of Figaro are up there. Yeah, figure out was really fun. So I guess you know yeah. what comes to mind is what what are you going to do uh, for the next season? I, I don't know if it's too early to talk about that. Uh, maybe not. Um, you know, you always have to take one of the ABC uh, uh, was it Aida, uh, Bohem, and Carmen kind of yeah. operas and see what happens yeah. there. And then and it's a, it's a, some avant garde opera just just to mix it up a little. And so the question is, what yeah. do you have in mind uh, for next year? So we actually have just announced our season, our, our subscription renewals are coming in. Thank you, subscribers. We love you. Um, but uh, we are, we, are, we start off the fall with uh, Madame Butterfly, which is one of those ABC. It's not really ABC, but it's it's in there of the top uh, hits. Uh, that'll be October 9, 11, and 13 at the Blaisdell. Uh, we've got a fantastic cast lined up, including a uh, wonderful Taiwanese soprano, uh, Karen Chaling Ho, as our butterfly. It'll be her hot debut and also her role debut. Um, and just a, just a great cast all around. Then um, we have in February, we're doing a production of an Offenbach operetta called Orpheus in the Underworld. 
it's a it's a hilarious spoof on the Orpheus myth where um, Eurydice is whisked away by Pluto, the god of the underworld, and Orpheus really couldn't care less because they didn't get along. Uh, but he is shamed into going to retrieve her by a character called public opinion. And in our case, we're calling it social media. Uh, so uh, it, it, hilarity ensues. At the end of it, it's a, it ends with a, a Offenbach's most famous can-can uh, number. If you've ever heard of can-can, you've heard that one. Uh, oh, so sure. a lot of fun. Um, we're setting it uh, underworld. Be, uh, in, in this operetta, the underworld is the place to be. It's the party place. So we thought, what better place to do that than a tropical paradise? So it'll perfect, be in a Hawaiian-like setting. Um, and sung in English, a uh, wonderful uh, English adaptation uh, from a, a company that I've worked with many years, uh, Pocket Opera in San Francisco. And then we finish the season in uh, April. Is, is Jamie with, uh, Offenbach going to be in the Offenbach Opera? Uh, we so wanted him to be, but he's he is already engaged to do a production of Mary Widow in Cincinnati. So uh, oh, no. unless he he, okay. he could not, and and he is uh, he is distantly related to Jacques Offenbach. Is that so right? That, oh, I that, didn't know that. Yeah. A, a double blow <laughs> for all good. of us, but uh, he is he's wonderful, and, and he'll be in several things in the in the season. Um, then in April we finish with uh, a production of a new work by Jake Heggie and Gene Shear called If I Were You. And it's a Faustian story. In this case, the devil character is a, uh, a woman named Britamara, and she will be played by our own uh, Blythe Kelsey, uh, amazing uh, mezzo-soprano, sister to uh, Quinn Kelsey, sister the baritone. Kelsey. That, yeah, uh, uh, Quinn Kelsey's sister. Uh, she, she is a uh, force to be reckoned with in, in wonderful ways. She's a great performer and a great voice, and she's going to really uh, take that role uh, uh, to the next level. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it deals with a kind of a, a soul uh, swapping where it's kind of sci-fi in, in that the, the, the person's soul transfers to the next person with some sort of incantation and, uh, and trouble ensues, as you might imagine. Um, but it, it's, ultimately, it's ultimately a love story and really beautifully told uh, with some gorgeous, gorgeous music. Uh, very tonal, don't be afraid, um, and should be a lot of fun. And that'll be directed well, by Karen Tiller, who used to be the executive. Oh, director. sure, I remember Karen. Karen, sure, she's been in and around uh, HOT for a long time. Yeah, he so, has. So um, want to keep it that way. <laughs> she's good. She's good uh, director for sure. So yeah. um, you know, you know, the the big issue is making sure that you cover the generational bases. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the problem in Hawaii is uh, the performing arts. You find the, the demographic gets older and older. The bell curve uh, extends into you know octogenarian and uh, not a lot of 20 year olds there and that's why yep. it's so important to do the educational programs but how are you oh, doing definitely. on that survive you've got to have young people yeah definitely and you know it's uh we have a, a wonderful board member andrea zanoni who, who has uh, been helping us with a program uh reinstituting something called gen hot uh, which is a young professionals group that is attracting uh, people to our performances with with a, a special events and uh, meetups because uh, you know the that that age set kind of the twenty to forties they're 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 really interested in socializing with their friends. I, not that my generation isn't too, but you know what I mean. Um, and so finding finding ways for them to connect uh, around opera. And, and we had a really successful uh, uh, first outing with them in uh, around the Tosca, where we had a hundred tickets sold, and they did a, a meetup at uh, a, a restaurant nearby, and then came to see the opera and uh, did the, the intermission reception and things. So it was a lot of fun for them. Uh, they did a good job with uh, Figaro as well. Um, so we're hoping to build on that, uh, get them engaged with Opera Ball, um, and just keep building on that. I think it's also important for us to offer, I think the diversity of programming helps. I think uh, doing more out in the community is vital for us. So we've been developing relationships with places like Salt and Akaka Ako, um, where we did a per performance of our Opera Express Cinderella that had 300 people come to it. Uh, we're, we're working uh, with connections at the International Marketplace, just being out in the community. Uh, the other thing that we're working on for next season is a chamber opera that would be done at UH Manoa at the or Orvis Auditorium called uh, Hometown to the World, which is about uh, uh, immigration and customs enforcement raid on a meatpacking plant in uh, well, Iowa. That's very relevant, that, isn't it? Yeah, that really um, brought that community together. Uh, just three people, three singers, a six instrumentalists, 
Uh, it should be a lot of fun, and I think it's also a it's a way it's a way to make opera seem more relevant. Uh, I personally think Tosca is relevant to society, the Me Too movement, but but you know it's maybe a little more stretched with something like the immigration raids that are happening now. So, um, but we have to, we have to do a diversity of programming and be out out of our house, being yeah. where people are. Don't forget, you you've got to do Tosca once in a while. You've got to do Bo oh, yeah, once course. in a while. And Traviata yeah. is essential once in a while. <laughs> it is. I, I will say that, you know, studies have shown that most people's first time ticket buying is to one of the traditional operas. You you yeah. you take you get them to come to a Tosca or an Aida or a Boheme and but then the trick is how do you get them to go to that second one? And I think the second one is gonna have to be by by something that a topic's gonna intrigue them. And you have to make sure that your experience that you're providing even at that Tosca is as engaging as it is with, with a, a super modern topic like uh, Hometown of the World. Yeah. So here we are, and you, you know, you've been kind of a victim of uh, the coronavirus. Um, it's, it's hurt you, um, and you know, with, with federal support or not, um, you know, you, you've been wounded in your, in your season <laughs> and maybe longer. You can talk about you know, additional performances. That means people got to get together. They, they cannot sing through masks. <laughs> they cannot do yeah. that. So, yeah. Although I remember, weren't there masks in Traviata? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> there was one opera with masks. Um, yeah. Maybe it was eye masks, not mouth masks. Um, yeah. In any event, uh, what what message would you leave to your viewers? Uh, both, you know, the older types like me, but also the younger types who would be the objects of your educational programs. What would you tell them now in this crisis of the community and crisis mm -hmm. of the arts? What message would you leave with them, Andrew? Well, I would say that if nothing else, this isolation of shelter from home has shown us how much we miss connecting as human beings. Um, we need to be in the presence of other people. We, we are social beings, not everyone, but, but a majority on the whole, we are social beings that like to be with each other. I think the performing arts pride provides a vehicle for that like no other, and it doesn't have to be classical arts. I'm talking about all performing arts that uh, where you are witnessing a shared experience, you are coming together to to see one thing, but you each are bringing your own selves to how you're perceiving that uh, production or that concert. And I think I'm hoping that when we get through this and we're able to once again venture out into public as, as, a, as a society, and feel comfortable doing that, that we will value even more those opportunities where we can share collective experiences, uh, where we can be a part of the community and not just a facile uh, viewer. I think it's important to participate. It's important to get engaged and feel like you're investing in something beyond your cell phone or your computer uh, or your television. Yeah, performing arts is community and, and it is, uh... It is the best part of humanity altogether. Uh, thank you, is, Andrew. Andrew us... Morgan, Executive Director. I'm sorry, are you going to say? That, no, I just said it, it is our humanity. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Andrew Morgan, Executive Director of the Hawaii Opera Theater, um, bringing us art that, that, that helps us even in very hard times, especially in hard times. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's my pleasure, Jay. I really appreciate it. Aloha.